We want to welcome those who may be at home and watching this at a later date, but we are picking up in our New Testament study, and that is in the book of Acts, which is the retelling of the early church and what God was doing. So we hope that you're blessed as you join us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story, your story, and the word of God that is alive, that endures. The flower may fade, the, the, the things of this earth will pass away, but the word of God last forever. And Lord Jesus, you said that not one yoked, not one tittle will, will pass away before all things be fulfilled. And you said that the law and the prophets all pointed to you. So Lord, we thank you that the Bible points us to you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith and the author of life. We ask that you would speak powerfully tonight to our hearts. We need to hear from God, but not just that we would hear from you, Lord but that we would do your word, that we would obey you. Thank you for showing us what desire of your heart is, what the desire is, who you use, and how we can be available. In Jesus' name, amen. So welcome once again. Uh, we are in an exciting study, and that is, it's the lifeblood of the early church. It's the testimonies. It's, we're gonna read some interesting stories today of, of suspense, escape, and uh, violence, and action, and that's the way the, the Lord really worked then. That's how he works now. He's alive and he is powerful and he's bigger than our circumstances. So as we turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 12, I want to encourage all of us to think about putting ourselves maybe in the shoes of the apostles, the early believers, because it's very applicable today. Now, we read last chapter basically that Peter had told the church in Jerusalem how God had poured out his grace on the Gentiles. It wasn't just for the Jews. And the Holy Spirit had fallen on this whole household of Cornelius, as we read about in Lystra and Joppa and all these areas near Caesarea, which was a port city. We see that God was doing a great work, and Peter was willing to let the Lord lead him. And he shared this testimony. And we see that Peter basically stands up, tells them, um, and while he was preaching to them that he didn't finish his sermon, so to speak, but God granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. In verse 18, we saw in chapter 11, he said they, they changed, they turned, they changed their mind, and now they are living a life eternal through faith in Jesus Christ. What an awesome, awesome message that Peter got to share with the Gentiles. Then Barnabas, we see, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on him, but Barnabas is this man. He was named son of encouragement because of his actions. We see he was a very, uh, very active person in the church in that he went around encouraging. He gave. He didn't necessarily see himself as a great teacher, but he saw his role as being one to equip the body and one to say, let's, let's administer, let's get the right folks in the right place. And he went out and sought a man named Saul, as we read about a couple chapters ago. Saul, who was used, he used to be a persecutor of the church, but Barnabas knew that he was a chosen vessel of the Lord. And it says that he sought him out. He searched. He, he basically went house to house or, or place to place looking for this Saul of Tarsus. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now, this is Antioch of Syria. I guess there were 20 Antiochs in that modern era, but this is one of the most populated cities in the Middle East. And in this, this place, they, there was an amalgam or a great melting pot of, of Greco-Roman religions. And so the Hellenistic Jews lived there, but also people who were used to worshiping idolatrous gods, false gods, demonic things. Now, I don't know if anybody heard about the Travis Scott concert last Friday, okay? But imagine that all the time, okay? This satanic influence on their culture. We had eight people die in Houston at a concert, and it was a very satanic ritual-like concert. Why do I say that? Because that spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of Satan is still at work today because he still is trying to deceive people. And this is a kind of culture, just kind of like America is degrading to today, is a culture that these Diaspora, or these fleeing Christians were walking into. They had joy, but they had nothing. They were running for their lives, so to speak. They were 
maybe came from Africa or Asia, now they're finding them, themselves in Turkey or my, Asia, Asia Minor, and here they are in Syria or Turkey, and they're like, I don't, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, and they were a joy, and it said that this is where people were first called little Christ or Christians in Antioch. And in these days, the prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus, he stood up. He said, hey, there's going to be a famine. So we had a prophecy and he's preparing the people to get ready for really troublesome times. And God spoke through that prophecy. And then the disciples, they each, according to their ability, they sent relief to Judea. And they also sent it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So we read in the letters of Saul that now Paul, that he had a heart for the poor. He said, I... I love giving to the poor. I, I made a lot of people poor. I feel terrible that I was a persecutor of the church. And here, this son of encouragement, Bar Barnabas and Paul, they were the people that brought benevolence back to the poorest of the poor Christians in Jerusalem. Now, it kind of reminds me, if you've been in your Bible in the Old Testament or you're doing a through the Bible study, when Jeconiah or Gedaliah, the ruler was in power and he was made a vassal king, which is kind of like a puppet king by Nebuchadnezzar. He rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and Jeremiah was a prophet at that time and they wanted to go down to Egypt and Jeremiah's like, no, 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 no. Like, don't, don't disobey God's will. You are going to be more blessed if you just surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in this time, the only people left after the three waves of the Babylonian captivity were the poor in Jerusalem. And it's there's something to be said for the fact that the poor have a special heart, a special place in the heart of God, in that they're rich in faith, but they're not putting trust in their own position, their own power, their own possessions, and they're not trying to coerce or use violence to get their will. So we look at the world today and most of it is might makes right or eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth or dog eat dog or shark tank type mentality. And in these days, the Christians that were fleeing Jerusalem had nothing. And so they stood in stark contrast, stark contrast, just as we should shine as lights in a great dark atmosphere. They did too, because here they are, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. And what are they doing? They're just... Hey, Jim, nice to meet you. I'm from, you know, Phoenicia. And hey, I just wanted to say, Jesus forgave me. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. You need to know Jesus. And people were just saying, we do. I do need to know Jesus. You're right. And the Jews weren't able to reach these people, but all of the diaspora, all the people running for their lives were able to reach untold multitudes. So let's read on in chapter 12, verse one. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some, of the church, some from the church. Now Herod, if you remember, he was an Edomite. And he was the last, his family, very corrupt family. They were the last of the Edomites, which were the descendants of Esau. They were very corrupt people. So he's like, hey, I'm going to harass some Christians because that makes everybody like me. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. He's like, hey, I killed James. It went pretty well. Let's take another one of those fishermen and let's make an example of him. So he took Peter. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So during the feast time. And so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. So he put him in jail. I'm going to put you in a holding tank. I'm going to set the bond at $2 million. You can't get yourself out, basically. He put 16 soldiers and all these gates and all this protection. Could you imagine? Peter's just like, wow, I'm a pretty dangerous guy, right? Just a fisherman sitting here in jail. But he's got so many soldiers, tetrad squads of four. He's got 16 soldiers guarding him. Now, watch what happens. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. While Peter's in prison, guess what the church is doing? They're on their knees. Yes, they're praying, right? And this cracks me up, though. They're praying constantly. They're having a prayer vigil. Okay, guys, let's, let's, we're not going to eat for a little while. We're going to pray. Everybody come in. Let's pray for Peter. He's in jail. He's in jail. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping 
bound with two chains between two so soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so he's guarded. He's literally chained to soldiers. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. So out of nowhere, a bright light. And he struck Peter on the side. He kind of kicked him like, wake up, man, get up. He struck Peter on the side. He raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. So the angel literally had to wake him up and said, get up, get out of here. Chains fall off. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie, your, tie on your sandals. So in those days, they wore robes. So they would kind of cinch it up or they would gather it up. So they wouldn't trip over the robe, obviously, and tie your sandals. So he laced up his shoes, so to speak. Put on your garment and follow me, the angel told him. So he went out and followed him, and he did not know that this was done by the angel. What had been done by the angel was real. He thought it was a, a vision. He was seeing a vision or a dream. Have you ever had something happen that was so surreal? You're like, am I dreaming? Again, this possibly... I've had it where it was really a dream, and I woke up and was upset, right? <laughs> like, I wish my dream was real. But in this case, it was the real thing. And he got woke up. He's walking out of jail. Now, I don't know if you've been to prison lately. I have. I don't know if you've been in a jail lately. I have. You do not get in and out very easily unless they press that button and the sally port opens, right? And many times you're going through two, three, four layers of sally ports. So imagine he's walking past 16 iron-clad or bronze-clad or golden-clad Roman soldiers, and they're just... Whatever. Whatever's going on, they are blind to it, right? Just like Three Stooges or something. They don't even know that he's leaving. So he went out and he followed him and he did not know what had been done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10, when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to an iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own accord, of its own accord. So like this iron gate, and I've been seeing many steel or iron gates. Yes, it's a relief when you can get out of prison and they've been, you've been waiting. I could only imagine if you thought you were a dead man. Right? He didn't know that he was guaranteed tomorrow. But here the iron gate swings open on its own accord. And they went out and they went down one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. It's like, okay, I've done my job. See you later. And when Peter, verse 11, had come to himself, kind of like the prodigal son, you know, he came to himself. But he came to himself. He came to his senses, so to speak. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So he's like, the Lord just delivered me. This is awesome. I'm a free man. So what does he do? He just, he looks around and he considered this. He came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So John Mark's mom's house, which he may have been related to where many were gathered together praying. These are his friends, right? We gathered together with other believers and he knew where they'd be gathering. And Peter knocked on the door of the gate and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. So hear this. He's knocking, knock, knock, knock. He knocks on the door and Peter sees Rhoda, the servant girl, this little girl, she comes. And I can imagine just like one of my daughters coming to the door and she recognized Peter's voice. But because of her glad, she oh, it's Peter, oh my goodness. And she's so excited, she didn't even open the gate, but she ran back inside, right? She just left him there. And she goes in and runs to everybody and says, Peter's here. She's, and they all looked at her. They're all in a prayer meeting praying for Peter who's in jail. And guess what they say to this Rhoda girl? Oh, you're out of your mind. You must be crazy. What are you talking about? You're beside yourself. And she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, oh, it's his angel. It's Peter's angel. Right? So they were just praying for hours, maybe. And God answered their prayer. And here she is announcing it. And they're like, oh, I don't believe it. Get out of here. Get out of town. Right? Are we like that? Sometimes we pray that God would move. And next thing we know, he answers. And we're like, no, that's no way. No way, God. But that's exactly what happened with Peter here and Rhoda and all the people. And, and it's just awesome. When Jesus said, you have little faith, he only needs a little faith. But he, he's patient with us. Aren't you glad that Jesus is patient with us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're patient. Absolutely. Hallelujah. So she recognized Peter's voice. She runs in. She leaves him at the door, which is not typical hospitality. 
and they say, you're crazy or you're out of your mind or it's his angel. Now Peter continues knocking and that she's standing right in front of them and they hear a knock, 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 right? And they're like, okay, well, maybe there's something to this. And uh, when they opened the door, they saw Peter. <laughs> oh, oh, Peter, yeah, we were just praying for you. Oh, buddy, old pal, so glad you're here. This is awesome. And the word astonished, obviously in Greek, is stone-eyed. You know, like their eyes were like stones. They're like, we can't believe our eyes. What's happening? But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Now, Peter's like, hey, Mary, James, or John Mark, I'm so glad to see you. Thanks for praying for me. I'm out. See you later. Have a good day. Tell all the brothers. And where do you think he's going to go, right? Peter had had this happen. Remember, it happened before where uh, they got released by an angel. And next thing you know, they're preaching the next morning in the synagogues, okay? So he departed and he went to another place. I love that. A messenger, uh, a servant of the Lord, when God does great things, he still wants to see what God wants to do next. So he moves forward. We don't stagnate. We don't sit on our laurels and say, oh, well, isn't this wonderful? I'll just chill. No. Then as soon as it was day, verse 18, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. Hey, can you imagine you had one job, right? You had one job, one person, and all 16 of them, okay? This gets really terrible. You had one job. Has anybody ever, it's kind of like we've watched The Incredibles, my family have watched that so many times and don't really care for some things on the second movie, but one thing about Jack-Jack is you turn around, he can walk through walls and he disappears. Well, in real life, you have children you can take your eyes off of them when they're in that toddler phase for just a few minutes, and next thing you know, they're gone. Well, that's not the same thing when you're chained to the officers. What's your explanation going to be now? Like, he's literally ball and chain, chained to these officers, and somehow they were in a stupor, and they didn't know he's, he's gone. So just like the soldiers at the resurrection tomb, they were like dead men, the guards, so to speak. But when they came out of their senses... And they snapped back to reality. They're thinking to themselves, what on earth? And there's a stir and everybody knows. You talk about controversy. You talk about suspense. Everyone knew. As many of your parents may have said in a different term, your bottom is, gra is grass, right? So, but it's that you're up a creek without a paddle. You are in big, big, deep deep stuff, okay? And so they, that's what I could just imagine. And we'll read about this with Paul and Silas with the Philippian jailer later on, but this, look what happens. This is why that Philippian jailer will wanna commit suicide. Watch what happens. When Herod, but when Herod had searched for him and not found him. Could you imagine? This is the same family as Herod the Great who said, find the king so I can worship him also, worship him also, and he murdered all of the babies who were two years old or younger in Bethlehem. And Rachel weeping for her children as Jeremiah prophesied. So he's storming into the prison. Where is he? Give me this guy. You could imagine like a mafia mob type. That's the kind of mentality of this king. He storms in and he didn't find them. So in his rage, he examines the guards and he commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Okay. Just think about that. Peter did not wish any harm to these officers, to these soldiers, right? He didn't wish anything. But that's the way the world is. God's will is done and the world is brutal. The world will, will turn on you in a moment. You could be doing everything right. And when God's will, we think about it. Jesus, is he on the throne, guys? Is Jesus on the throne right now? Amen. Yes, he is. And does any of this nonsensical stuff that our culture has thrown our way surprise Jesus? No. 
Is he bigger? <laughs> Absolutely. So looking at this story, we see God on the throne, not being surprised, but Herod trying to take matters that were much bigger than him into his own hands. He's taking the lives of innocent people, just like his daddy, Herod the Great, or just like his uncle or whoever. There's so much enmeshment and um, mess in that family. But we see this poor guards, you know, they weren't doing anything wrong. They were just doing their job. And we're celebrating Veterans Day this, you know, tomorrow, right? These guys were honorable men. Honorable men just trying to do their job. So here we see the tyrannical nature of the kings of this earth and how they will just flip a lid and they don't care who they hurt. Let's, let's contrast that with the king of kings that Peter was arrested for. The one, the prince of peace, who never commanded us to harm another person, who said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, do good to those who spitefully use you. When they say all manner of evil against you falsely on account of me, rejoice and be very glad, because they did the same thing to the prophets, they're going to do it to you. Look at the contrast, right? We have a gentle, we have a gentle savior who holds all of eternity in his hands, he, he holds... Uh, Everything together with the word of his power, as Hebrews tells us. And then we have an earthly king who says, I'm going to destroy you. And he literally can kill you, flesh and blood. But Jesus said this, as you all very well probably know. Do not fear him who can destroy just your, your body. Fear him who has the power and authority to destroy your body and soul in hellfire. Jesus doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He has true authority. And what did he do for us? He laid down his life. And yet... The kings of the earth plot in vain, as Psalm 2 very clearly describes. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Where's Tyre and Sidon? Tyre and Sidon is up north. And if you have like, had the privilege, we've been studying the life of David on Sunday mornings. And Solomon. Well, the king of Tyre sent a lot of sycamore trees and two, or two and a half or three tons of gold, literally, to Solomon. Like tons and tons of gold. But Tyre was kind of Syrophoenician, so Syrian, Phoenician. They were the ships that had the dragon heads. You know what I'm talking about? They ruled the Mediterranean. So the king of Tyre is also chronicled or described very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 28. And what does God have to say about the prince of Tyre, the king of Tyre? That because of the multitudes of his trading... Because of his wickedness, he's traded spices and, and goods and gold and silver and souls of men. It actually is talking about the principality behind him and Satan himself. So Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, where it talks about Lucifer, son of the morning, and the prince of Tyre. Tyre has a symbolic, kind of like a New York City or a Los Angeles harbor, a symbolic of Babylon-ish, uh, what I would say, magnitudes that God was not pleased with the king of Tyre at that time. But Tyre is this coastal city, as you recall in Matthew's gospel, that Jesus sent the disciples and he went up um, to Tyre and Sidon, which is Galilee of the Gentiles. He went to the Gentile regions. And it's, it's kind of a, a coastal melting pot, like I said. It's, it's the Gentile region. Well, Tyre and Sidon being those coastal cities... Tyre was scraped into the sea, if I recall. In Ezekiel, there's a prophecy that describes what happened. I believe Alexander the Great did it. And they moved the whole city of Tyre one mile out into the Mediterranean, and he raised or leveled the city of Tyre and scraped it as an isthmus out into the Mediterranean Sea to make a land bridge. <laughs> they were so wealthy, right? They, were, they had so much abundance, they thought they could just buy their way out of their problems. So Tyre, even in this time, was a wealthy area because of its coastal location. But they, Tyre and Sidon were notoriously wicked, though, too, because of that. He was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon because he was taxing them, so to speak. But they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supposed 
was supplied with food by the king's country. Now, once again, Caesarea, where Herod just went, you can go there today, and there's a hippodrome, there's a, the Czechoslovakian, um, what you would call, during the Czech struggles, some of those um, people who were displaced during the struggle 25, 30 years ago, they came and they helped rebuild some of these ruined areas. But Caesarea Maritime, it's a beautiful place right on the coast. There's a, a horse track. There's a, an auditorium. There's a, one of the largest ever discovered warm jacuzzi type uh, Olympic size almost pool. Two pools right beside each other. And people fish to this day right there off the coast of the Mediterranean. But this is where he went. He went to this coastal city. And we're going to talk about something. Big old letter starts with F. And the word is flattery. Do you think that politics and pompous flattery is a thing of, of recent history? No, <laughs> it is not. And we'll see Paul kind of exercise self-control to not be flatter, a flatterer. But here, they knew that they depended. They were sycophants. They were sucking up to Herod because they knew if they didn't have this, this man, Herod, who owned all the ships in the port, and he directed all the commerce. He made sure that the Mediterranean was stocked with all the goods coming and going. He, his ships were the first to depart in the winter, fully stocked for, for the springtime. They knew that if they were on the bad side of Herod, they would be hungry. Um, similar to Pharaoh's people having dependence on him, similar to the, the way we see powers in play today, well, so on a set day, Herod, he dresses up in his finest apparel. Maybe it was like a white with gold, right? Um, some shiny outfit where, where he was just glistening, right? And the people, verse 22, they kept shouting. Now this is crazy, but they said this. The voice of a God and not of a man. Notice when Peter, when people would bow down at his feet. Remember just last chapter, the chapter before, Cornelius being a centurion, an officer from Rome who, or from the Roman Empire who was over 100 soldiers, he bowed at Peter's feet and he's like, get up, get up, what are you doing? I'm just a man, just like you. What does Herod do? Absolutely nothing. He enjoys it. Because he likes flattery and he wanted to be worshipped because that's the spirit of the Antichrist, which is at work in the world. And it says immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. Hmm. Anybody remember that? We should. I think there's some people in the Oval Office who should remember that over the years, right? I'm not saying any, any party lines, whatever. I'm just saying you are not God. I'm not God, you're not God. God is God and I am not. Remember that song and that phrase? And I'm so glad that God is God. I'll let him be God. I'll just be his child. I'll be, I'll be the one who says, you know, all glory to you, all glory to you. And that's not what Herod did. But what I love is verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Kings will rise, kings will fall, right? Personalities, money, riches, power, nations. What's going to last? The word of God growing and being multiplied. I said something before we went live, and that was this. If you don't have the YouVersion Bible app, get it. Life Church did an excellent job, but it's way bigger than Life Church. It's way bigger than our church. Way bigger. It's God's Word. All these languages. You can listen to it every day, free of charge. You can listen to it. You can read it. You can copy paste it. You can share it. You can do Bible plans. 500 million devices as of today have downloaded this app. The Word of God. Um, if you could pull up verse 24 there. The 1224, if you can get it. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Why is it important that the word of God multiplies? Well, Isaiah 55 says that God's word will accomplish all that he set it forth to accomplish. 
like the seed to the sower and, and how water comes down and waters the crops. Have you seen people harvesting crops just yesterday? Have you guys seen the fields and had a chance to drive down 254 or 54 lately? I mean, they're harvesting. They are getting it done. They've got sorghum fields, alfalfa fields. I mean, they're, I think the alfalfa is what they were cutting yesterday when I was coming down 295th. But you look at that, there has to be a seed and water and photosynthesis and all of that. The word of God is like that. It's a seed. And literally in Greek, Jesus used the word sperma is a seed, like what we talk about the recreation or uh, creation or procreation with our having children. Same terminology because it has to start somewhere. You have to have the egg and the sperm. You have to have the seed in the ground and the water and the photosynthesis. Here too, we see the word of God Persecution didn't stop it. It was almost like fertilizer, like nitrogen. You see a, a lightning storm. There's this film called God of Wonders. If you go on YouTube, you can look up God of Wonders. It used to be godofwonders.org or .com. I think there's 25 lightning strikes every second, something like that, because they have this little blurb on lightning. It's really fascinating. Something like five or probably up to five or 10 million lightning strikes a day. And you think to yourself, why so much lightning? Well, lightning produces nitrogen that then gets rained on and fertilizes the land. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Crazy how genius our God is. You got people trying to grow stuff with hydroponic systems inside their house. And it's like, it's, God does the best. Now, we try to do all these drip irrigation systems, which is like the Garden of Eden, and that's cool. But the Word of God is like that. It's a seed. And even with persecution, even with your Herods, Herod, Herod destroying and killing, it didn't slow it down. It actually was like a lightning bolt. It created fertilizer. So we see here, the Word of God grew and multiplied. I pray that the Word of God multiplies in your heart and in your life and that you do get the Bible app. <laughs> the U version Bible app or anything. Find it, find it, and get into a study. Get through through the Bible. If you read your Bible and pray every day, it makes a huge difference in your life. Amen. So it's like a steady diet, and we, we focus on our exercise, our diet and balance. If all I eat is ramen noodles, I'm gonna be a ramen noodle, right? I hear they're really good if you crush up tortilla chips in them, but I don't know. I haven't had it for years because it's too much. Salt. Anyway, my point is balanced diet. If I only read the things I like to read in the Bible, I'm not going to get that balance. When I am going through Jeremiah lately, it's depressing as all get out. I'm like, what in the world? Lamentations, Jeremiah. And I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? It's really depressing. Well, he's kind of warning us that when we see wickedness around us, there's judgment. There's consequences when there's sin in the land that God will deal with it. There's retribution. And we can't just keep on sinning. So you look at that, you can't just study the things you like in the Bible. As I think it was Mark Twain who said it, maybe I'm wrong, you can look it up. It's not the things that I do understand about the Bible that I, or that I don't understand about the Bible that I have a problem with, it's what I do understand. And when you study the Word of God, the more broadened you understand everything God's commanded you, to love Him supremely, to love your neighbor, and everything that comes in between, how to what's right, what's not right, how to get right, how to stay right. You will forget. But Jesus says, if you're faithful to the light that you have, more light will be given. If you're not even obedient to the light you have, then even what you do have will be taken from you. So there's a faithfulness component. So the word of God multiplied in the face of persecution. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they also took with them John Mark, or John whose surname was Mark. So remember, Peter went to John Mark's house, and that John Mark is the one who authored the Gospel of Mark. So we just studied that not too long ago, before we went to the book of Luke. But Mark, John Mark, a lot of people will say he wrote the Gospel of Peter. So when you read the Gospel of Mark, it's really from Peter's standpoint, if you want to look at it that way. Because John Mark... The only time he may have mentioned himself is in the very end of the book when there was a young lad who ran away after the Garden of Gethsemane incident who was wearing a loincloth. Like he fled away naked because he was scared because he was a young man. Some people, that's, he didn't even write about himself. 
John Mark wrote from Peter's perspective. It was all about Peter's encounters. And John Mark's gospel is really straightforward. It's very clear and concise. It's one of the shortest, but Mark, 90 plus percent of Mark is in Matthew and Luke. So it seems like John Mark wrote the first gospel, Matthew and Luke followed. Why is that important? Because not only did John Mark have Peter's perspective, John Mark got to see the work of God in the lives of Paul and Barnabas with the Gentiles. So a lot of cool things in the Gospel of Mark are, are universal to Jews and Gentiles alike. Matthew wrote to the Jews. Luke wrote, wrote from a, a perspective of a Greek physician, and so he's very detailed. John, the beloved, wrote basically on the love of God, the, the son of man, and he explained all the I am's that Jesus was, and he, more mystical, but really awesome gospel. All of them are unique. But interestingly, John Mark travels, and the word of God was multiplied. We'll read just a couple more verses. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So it's just kind of a couple things we could just rest uh, and think about for a minute. Prayer was vital for the early church. Prayer is vital today. Amen. Prayer is vital in my life. Prayer is vital in your life. My wife who just, you know, you see my wife on a regular basis. I don't know what my relationship would be like with my wife if I only listened to her and never talked with her. Or if I only talked with her and never listened to her. Or I just ignored that she even existed. Imagine a church which is called the body of Christ or the bride of Christ not talking to her husband. Okay. Paul likens it to this in 1 Corinthians 12. We are all parts of the body, right? There's some are a mouthpiece, some are a hand, some are a foot. You can't hear with the hand and you can't touch with, or you can't smell with the eye. I mean, you can't talk with your foot. So, I mean, you could, but not really. But the idea is this, you know, if there was a wonderful uh, video when I was growing up early in my faith, where the guy's just kind of sitting here talking, right? And all of a sudden his arms just, everything's normal about him except one arm just always going crazy and like, you know, just nuts, right? And you're like, that's what it's like when one part of the body of Christ is disconnected from the head. Now, someone was talking, I think Joey may have mentioned when you're, maybe my son did, because they're into fishing and I like fishing too, but if you're trying to clean a fish and it touches steel, it, it will, even though it's a dead fish, decapitated fish, whatever, it will have that nervous, like, twitchiness to it. My point is this. The, the brain, you can have someone who's brain dead and all that, but sometimes when someone's dead or whatever, they can still move. I don't want to be a dead, disconnected body, disconnected from the head. Christ is the head of the church, amen? And the early church recognized that without him, we can't do anything, like John 15, 5 says. And just like Moses said, if you're not going to go before me, God, if you're not going to be with me, I don't even want to go. Like, you have to, right? And, um, you know, our culture's kind of lost this devotion to marriage, even some things like uh, there's, some, there's a mentality, I've heard this said, I won't tell you where, but I've heard it, if you leave me, I'm going with you, <laughs> right? It's almost that mentality has to be there when, in your current committed relationships, and we live in a throwaway culture where it's like, well, if it, I don't like it, I'm going to leave it or I'm just going to throw it out. And that is not, no, 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 no. That is not the church. That is not the way we are. And Jesus, in the early church, his word was multiplying and people were dependent upon him. And guess what? Because of their dependence upon him, he worked powerfully and he transformed lives. So once again, going back to two chapters ago, Peter had to be woken up. God had to say, hey, don't call what I say is clean, unclean. Go to the Gentiles, share the good news. They're welcome. And then we see he shares and God, because he was praying, he was seeking the Lord's face. And the, it gets confirmed to the church. 
And we see here in our prayer life, we get connected to the head of the body and he leads us in different ways. I'm so thankful for these kids screaming in the background and all the volunteers, right? That's what our church is here for. We're here to serve. And I was talking with Rachel earlier and she's like, I wasn't trying to take people away from him. I'm like, dude, or Rachel, if people come in here and they're encouraged, <laughs> they're encouraged, there may be seasons where they serve for a few months and they come back and they're equipped and they serve for a few months. You know, it's a wonderful thing when we have so many servants that we don't need anymore, you know, and that's cool. And that's a healthy body because we're connected to the head and you serve where God's called you to serve. And so what I like about the early church is they were tender enough to listen and the Holy Spirit says, hey, I got something for Saul. I got something for Barnabas. I want you to set them apart. I want them to do this special work. Was that an audible voice? Do we really know? You know, the Holy Spirit's spoken powerfully to my heart many times, and I know he's probably done that for you. But many times he confirms in the heart of various people because the whole, same Holy Spirit that's in me is in you can confirm this is what we ought to do here. And so I love that they sought that agreement from the Spirit, and I love that they waited on the Lord and the power we see in prayer, amen? The answers to prayer. And it's so funny that we got that illustration of Rhoda and all the praying friends of Peter saying, oh, it's just his angel, right? How much is that like us? We get answered, God answers your prayer exactly what you need, and you're like, no, nah, that was just a coincidence. Yeah, I... Just luck. No, we as believers believe in the providential, provisional, like God provides with his mighty hand. Amen? So the word of God is living and powerful and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even soul and spirit, the intents of the heart, like bones and marrow, like it's hard to separate sometimes the bone from the marrow. But God's word can separate even the most intricate areas of your life and say, you know, Jim, you're doing great here, but you need to tweak that. Or Justin, you know, I like what you're doing here, but the way you said that or the way you did that needs to be changed. The Holy Spirit can whisper through his word, through his scripture to remind you where you're out of step. So I love that about the Lord. And as we see God working powerfully, remember, I don't care what the government does to you and kills you. However you die, you could die the worst death like James or the worst death like whoever. You're going to die when God wants you to die. <laughs> and that you're going to die gracefully because you're in the hands of the Lord. Your spirit goes to be with the Lord. And I don't care what the, who's in power. If we lived in Russia and Vladimir Putin, if we live in America and Biden, if we live in China and Xi, whoever. At the end of the day, Herod thought he was doing got his will, but God's will was done. Herod thought he was arresting Peter. God's like, let me show you what you really have control over, Herod, and it was very little. You have control, you can sin, you can choose an evil attitude, you can choose a rebellious spirit, but you cannot stop the work that I wanna do. And so can I put it this way, and I've heard missionaries say it before. When you're in the middle of God's will, when you're pleasing to him, when you are faithfully obeying him and you want his best for your life, you are like Super Mario Brothers indestructible. That is you, right? You hit that, that golden star and you are indestructible until the moment God says, that's it, I'm ready to take you home. That makes sense? That is our hope. You're indestructible because of your faith in Jesus Christ and because you're in tune with Jesus, the head of the body. He will use you. Well, I don't feel very important. Well, maybe you're a spleen, okay? But you are important to the body of Christ, just like a kidney. What does a kidney do? If you have a bad liver, spleen, or kidney, you cannot deal with the toxins that come into your body properly. You cannot excrete the, the nastiness out. And we need people to get, to be interceding and to help pray that evil is rid of, we have angels here. We have demonic forces attacking all the time. If you knew how many attacks we've had in the last few weeks, you, you could probably tell me several, right? But as we, and as I'm talking with you, you know, preaching to the choir, as we seek the Lord, persecution, trials, and spiritual warfare are a thing. But, wow, what, you all are important to the process. You know, you might be, you may, some days I feel like I'm, I'm a 
gut, like, or I'm a shoulder. Sometimes I feel like a, a, a mouthpiece, like a, I'm the voice. But I'm content if God, I was content in the preschool, right? Cassie and I, all, we're just, people are like, do you guys, are you okay? We, don't, we haven't seen you in a while. We've been in the preschool for the last three or four years. <laughs> like, we love it. It's fine. It's good. Every Sunday, it's all good. Well, will you lead worship? I guess, yeah, sure. If Joey's like, I'll do it if Justin does it with me. But we were content back there. So it doesn't matter. Preschool, cradle to the grave, right? Wherever God's calling you, right? Everything is just as important. And if God still wants to use you, he can break through prison walls to get you where he wants you. So just remember, you may feel like Peter, like what's going on in my life? And Jesus might be right on the verge of breaking you out of something that brings so much glory to him, right? But the world can't stop what God's got in store for you. You're indestructible. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we ask that there be a blessed time of prayer right now, that we would meet with you. And throughout this week, you know, we think about the veterans who served our country. We think about these poor soldiers who lost their life because of a tyrannical leader, lack of leadership. Lord, and we just commit our lives to you, Jesus. We know your will will be done, but we want to be in the middle of your will. Lord, we want to be obedient to you like Peter and Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and the early church as they sought you. Lord, we need you even more than ever because we know the day's way much closer, <laughs> it's way closer than when we first believed and so much more of a need uh, for us, just as much of a need, I should say, as the early church. So Jesus, we do give our nation to you. We give our communities to you. We give our hearts and our families, our neighbors and our coworkers, especially those who haven't trusted you. Use us, Lord, each one of us to share the gospel, the good news. You know, Jesus came, he died, he rose again so that you could be free forever to be with the Father. May we share that message. May people receive and say, I do believe, I do confess Jesus is the way the truth of life. I do want him to be my Lord and Savior. May we lead people in that direction, that lead them in that prayer and show them the lifestyle that it's exciting, maybe somewhat scary to our old nature. It is very scary sometimes in our old nature. We get worried, we get afraid, but when we remember we're indestructible until you want to take us home, Lord, it gives us great comfort. So give us that boldness, give us courage in the face of persecution to know that you the God of angels' armies, protect us and your will will be done. But help us to be uh, like the prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil and let your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives. Help us to be merciful image bearers, the children of the great king. And we say to other people, welcome to the kingdom. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, welcome to the kingdom. May we reconcile people to you, Lord. Thank you for the story. Thank you for the humor. But most of all, thank you for the power that you show us through Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen. I would just encourage you to take some time with you're at home, you're here, you know, just find somebody, pray. You know, people, I, I may have not met you, I may not know what's going on in your life. The only way someone can know how to pray for you is just share what's going on, what's going on in your life. And uh, God will break some prison walls down. And not only that, he wants to use your life to bring people to him. So just remember, you've got people that need the Lord. May he use you this week.